Hi, well, my name is Emmanuel Masongsong. I'm a project specialist here at UCLA in the Department of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences. And my job ranges from coordinating research with satellites that study Earth's magnetic field and solar storms, a field called space weather, um, to working in the machine shop where we are now um, on a, a project called ELFIN, uh, the Electron Loss and Fields Investigation, which is going to be UCLA's first entirely built satellite here on campus. Um, Um, when I started here at this position um, in uh, Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences, um, I was doing some office work, um, some web design, like um, promotional um, type stuff for our NASA mission. Um, and um, I had some ideas about ways to engage the public since a lot of what we study now was completely new to me. Um, I had, had telescopes, I had done a lot of reading and research about astronomy and planets and black holes and everything. And um, I thought I knew a lot about space, but I had never heard of space weather. So I started researching it and finding all this information and cool stuff about magnetism that most people don't even appreciate how important magnetism is even for life on Earth um, and for our ability to visit other planets um, and formation of the solar system. I mean, it's, it's really profound. And so I wanted, I was really, really passionate about sharing that information. So I brought up these ideas to my boss and he's like, yeah, go for it. Here's some funding here, build a plasma generator so you can take it to schools. And they needed somebody to work in the machine shop to basically supervise and I didn't have to do any technical work, but I just was the body in the room for safety. And students would come to me and ask me questions. Uh, how come this isn't cutting right? Or I'd hear something break and I'd walk over there and we'd talk it through and like, well, what happened? What can we do to, to re, uh, reinforce this, this setup and everything like that? And so I had to kind of pick up the skill on, on, the, on the job. And then I became the trainer for new students who had zero skill. And so I had to develop my own capacity um, and then once we got to a certain level, I started getting handed projects. Okay, we need to build this. You find the parts, you order it, you figure out how to make it, you assign the tasks to the students. Um, so it kind of just was out of necessity. Yeah. Um, things needed to get done, and the one of the main engineers was already totally swamped. Um, so they just needed someone else that was able to fill in and take, take weight off of him. So this little globe has a magnet inside of it, just like our planet does. And that magnet is oriented north-south. So we have here a little probe um, called the magna probe. So the magnet in this little probe actually wants to follow the lines of magnetic force that come out of the magnet. So even though we can't see the magnetic field, this proves to us that even though we have, don't have that sense that there's a magnetic field surrounding this globe, just like our Earth in space. And even though it's entirely invisible, it actually has a huge impact on our society and the formation of life on Earth. Um, and um, it impacts our ability to visit other, uh, other planets, it tells us um, how uh, a solar system might have formed. There's all sorts of things that magnetism ties into. Um, so the, the main thing that we study is solar eruptions on the sun that come from sunspots. So sunspots are actually little magnets on the surface of the sun. And depending on how unstable they are, they can actually erupt and release material that goes towards the Earth. And when it gets to the Earth, it can actually burn out satellites, it can uh, expose uh, astronauts and people on airplanes at high altitude um, to radiation. Um, it can also block radio communications uh, and GPS. So you think about drones and automated cars and tractors and airplanes and all these things that we're hoping for, um, they're dependent on GPS. And if a satellite's orbiting out here and gets zapped, then your car is going to run into a wall. Or if the satellites are, are moving around and there's disturbance caused by um, these solar storms that affect our magnetic field and make it shake, that actually garbles the signal for the GPS and so you would lose your location. Um, or turn on the radio and there'd be static, those kinds of things. So we're, as a society, more and more aware of this and the White House has um, actually taken a stand on this um, and there's uh, more and more research that's showing how big of an impact, um, I think the latest figure was something like four billion dollars a day if there was a solar storm that impacted our power systems. Um, so the last thing is that um, because Earth has a magnetic field um, that would be shaking in response to a, a solar storm, that magnetic field moving can create electrical currents in wires on the ground, and that can actually blow up power stations. So our electrical system is vulnerable um, to space weather as well. We're actually very proud to be building uh, UCLA's first satellite. Um, UCLA has been involved in space missions since the 50s, uh, including um, Apollo. Uh, we built magnet, magnetic field measurement uh, uh, systems for the moon. Um, we sent uh, sensors to Jupiter, 
Um, we sent them to Mars. We're, we have another mission that's going to the moon, um, another one that's going to uh, one of the asteroids to study magnetism there. Um, so magnetism is our bread and butter. So this is the latest. Uh, it's a, called a CubeSat. It's a microsatellite about the size of a loaf of bread. And contained in this small package, which is 30 centimeters by 10 centimeters square, um, it has two eyes for looking at uh, electrons and ions as they stream through space from the sun in the solar wind. And then it's going to have a little uh, boom that, that is nested in here and it shoots out and there'll be a magnetic field detector on the end just like the little probe I showed you. So this would go out here and this can tell us what direction the magnetic field is in and uh, how strong it is. So as Elfin orbits around uh, polar orbit um, north over the north and south poles, it's going to be measuring um, the solar wind as it enters the north and south to create the aurora. So if we see a big solar storm and Elfin is orbiting and it sees a, a large uh, burst of particles, um, then um, we'll be hoping that, that the right conditions uh, are, are there, that we can both measure the, the magnetic field that's oscillating because of the, the solar storm, we'll be able to measure the particles. Then on the ground, we have cameras all across North America that can photograph the sky. And so it should be a sequence of magnetic field, particles, and then the aurora brighten up um, within minutes. So it's going to be entirely new science, and this is being built by undergraduates and a um, couple graduate students and staff here at UCLA, but the team is about 40 to 50 students. Um, it demands a lot of time. Um, I know a lot of people have struggled to, to joke with their coursework, but hey, if you're going to work on something that's going to space, um, that's pretty amazing. So I, in particular, um, work with a team that does the CNC machining to make um, these rails, which uh, make up the chassis, um, and then all the support structures, and then we're actually building the particle detector um, unit itself. So it's going to have panels that are covering all four faces that will have, um, it's actually a really pretty dark blue um, with yellow lines in it. Go Bruins. I've also been working with a student um, that um, is building a drone um, that's a pretty heavy payload drone. It's an octocopter. Um, and it's going to have a long boom beneath it to study um, magnetic fields above the Earth's uh, surface. So basically mapping um, earthquake faults, um, any like uh, deposits of minerals. Um, it can also be used for oil exploration, um, um, various things. So we're developing a, a, an autonomous system basically that we can tell it where to go. It'll fly at the right height, it'll measure the magnetic fields, sample everything, collect GPS data, take pictures, and then land, we take the data, and then we make a map of the environment and then correlate that with uh, like photographic maps, satellite maps, um, and then eventually I'd, I'd hope that we can have a a drone that will do its own lidar and like high resolution altitude mapping, phot photography, and then the latest thing I've seen is you can actually take all this data and make a virtual reality, um, uh, like interactive uh, environment. So you can actually go to a, a, a field site and actually go into a, a fault or a canyon or whatever and take closer look at uh, your 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 area without having to actually be there. Um, be able to measure points in three three dimensions, that kind of thing. So it's it's really an exciting time for Earth science and um, geophysics that we can use drone technology now to do things that otherwise we would have had to climb a mountain with a big backpack and a GPS system and carrying all the equipment and everything. So you can just put it on a machine and let it fly. So as part of any science program, you have to take calculus. Um, you can't let it intimidate you. So the earlier you can actually expose yourself to it, and even if it means um, auditing a class at a community college or reading a calculus for dummies. Um, math is going to be foundational and even if you don't use math on an everyday basis, it's funny talking to physicists, they're like, yeah, I don't really care about equations anymore and they just use software and whatever, the equivalent of calculators now. Um, but getting that background in the math is what's going to get you into a good school. It definitely helps to learn stuff with people. Um, instead of, um, I pretty much like to teach myself kind of everything on my own, but whenever I learn something with other people, I get much more out of it. You learn things much faster. Um, so there is that, that temptation too when you're in college and you want to do really well that, oh, I don't really need anyone else's help. I'm just going to do this homework on my own. Um, but one of the strongest, um, or one of the, 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 the most powerful ways to get the most out of a class is to have a study group and to be able to digest information together and um, work on homework together and then you build friendships and then you 
get to know other people and sort of hear their motivations for what they're interested in. Um, I mean, when I was in elementary school, one of my best friends used to always say I want, he wanted to be a marine biologist. I didn't even know really what that entailed, but I was like, yeah, I guess I want to be a marine biologist too. Um, so that was one of my early sort of career fancies. <laughs> um, if you know people that work in a field that is interesting to you, tell your parents and pretty much all, all it takes sometimes is just like, hey, can my son come visit or daughter? And you just get to see it and that can be a whole new level of motivation uh, to see something that you thought you were interested in and be like, hell yeah, this is what I want to do. Um, so my biology teacher, AP biology teacher, uh, was Mr. Picard. <laughs> Basically, as soon as you're able to find ways of visiting um, workplaces or reading about, yeah, like the, the daily life of, of what people do um, and actually getting to see the equipment they work with, um, see if you can take a tour of a lab or um, any kind of like yeah, research um, based um, thing um, or even finding a tour of like going to tour JPL. UCLA has a big open house every year in November where you can see a bunch of uh, 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 like science demonstrations and talk to real scientists and professors and um, basically getting to talk to people and, and pick their brains. So like at first I was embarrassed to ask um, just random questions, but the people that work in these fields are, are really enthusiastic about what they do, then they're happy to tell you about it. So um, I wouldn't be embarrassed even just emailing some random person, um, like a technician or something, if you find someone's name on LinkedIn or whatever and email them and you say, oh, I'm interested in what you're doing. Um, I was actually buying and selling telescopes for a while and I happened to meet a guy that was a nuclear scientist um, uh, with the Navy. He worked on um, submarines. And one of my students on Elfin um, was, was interested in nuclear science um, and specifically working for military. Um, and so I told him to contact that guy and that was like a total random connection, but um, that got him onto a boat and now he's in the, in the Navy and he's a, an engineering officer. Um, so making these small connections, even if you're embarrassed about it, can actually form a, a bridge to somebody that can give you advice or even potentially um, help you get a position where they're working. Um, just because you study something and you commit however many years to it, doesn't matter how many, um, you shouldn't necessarily restrict yourself to that and feel like you're abandoning it. Um, since I spent 12 years working in cancer research, HIV research, clinical research, and I felt it was incredibly important, I got published. I worked with researchers from all over the world. I got to travel, got to present at conferences, and it was great. Um, and I didn't want to give it up because I had invested all of that. I had my name, um, I had all these co connections and everything, but at the end of the day, I wasn't really happy doing what I'd been doing for so long and I needed to change and I just had to admit that to myself. Um, and it also took my wife giving me uh, a stern talking to that she didn't like how I was pretty much unhappy and kind of avoiding uh, work at times and so it's like, okay, you need to do something different. So it's, it's, you're not giving up and you're not a quitter if you switch to something different, um, but just think about all the skills and the, the um, sort of perspective you've gained, um, problem solving skills, um, whether any, any technical ability that you have can and probably will translate to uh, another job. Well, um, thanks for uh, having me today and if anyone wants to, to reach out and uh, ask any questions, um, feel free to contact me, my information is below. And thanks for watching Working in Science, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe.